Hello, my name is Jeffrey Sun. I'm a member on Team 861 Sensor Tobertech. So today we're going to be talking about sensors. So these are the sensors that we've uh, used over our five years of experience. Uh, these five years have been pretty successful. Used a lot of sensors in our pro in our programs and on, on our robot. So we'd like to share just uh, some sensors to highlight from our experiences over just a variety of different usefulnesses. So starting with the color sensor. So the color sensor, so the, the, we've only used three main ones uh, over the last five years. So last year, we started with the Rev color range sensor. So it's part of the Rev set. It's relatively new. We found it worked pretty well. It measure, measures RGBA, which is red, green, blue, and alpha. Uh, so instead of the Rev color range sensor, instead of uh, reading back a singular uh, color value and instead reads back to different sh color values of the red, green, blue, and alpha. So instead of just telling you, oh, this line is green, it instead tells you what is the green value for this line? What is the blue value for this line? What is the red value for this line? What is the alpha? Alpha is just how bright it is, the uh, transparency. Uh, the red color range sensor also functions as a distance sensor. So it uh, has a range sensor built into it. Um, the range sensor goes 5 to 25 centimeters. Uh, I wouldn't recommend using it solely for a range sensor, uh, but I would recommend the range sensor to uh, move in closer to the object that you're trying to detect. Say you are trying to detect a ball uh, that's not close enough for your color sensor to read, then you can use the range sensor to try to get closer. So that's uh, what we found the range sensor to be most useful. Um, another thing to note about the Rev color range sensor is that it's part of the Rev set. So it works well with the Rev expansion hub, which is the newest uh, control set for FTC. So the connection is, works better because they are of the same company, so you don't need any uh, translators or anything like that. Uh, one last thing about the Rev color range sensor, its design is kind of bulky and it's kind of awkward. Uh, this is the newest design that has two holes on opposite sides of the sensor, but there's an uh, older design that only has one hole, so uh, these designs are relative, they can be hard to mount on your robot, but uh, that's not, if you can find a way to use it, these sensors are really good working with the uh, Rev expansion hub. So moving on to the modern robotic color sensor. So this is the uh, control set. Uh, this is part of the modern robotics control set. So, uh, unlike the Rev color range sensor, it returns a color value. So 0 to 16 gives a def definite color. So 0 to 16 on this color spectrum, starting 0 at the darkest, 16 at the lightest. Um, besides that, it also returns the RGB values, like the Rev color sensor does the red individual red, green, and blue color values. Uh, as I said before, it's a modern robotics sensor, so if you have the modern robotics control set, it will work better there. But if you have the Rev Expansion Hub and you're working with a modern robotics color sensor, uh, you need a, a connector that translates the wires to the Rev Expansion Hub, which can be, uh, the connection isn't that good. So I, if you have a modern robotics a control set, I would recommend the modern robotics color sensor. So both of these two sensors work pretty well. We found them pretty useful. Um, just different control sets might want different color sensors because they have better connections. So last but not least, we have the Adafruit RGB sensor. So this is the one that we've used the least because we, this is the one we have not found the most reliable, but it works fairly well. So it measures RGB, so the individual red, green, blue color values like the other two sensors, and also the alpha value, which the modern robotics color sensor does not. Um, one thing, so the Adafruit, the reason why we don't use it that much is because of its design. Unlike these two other sensors, they're kind of bulky, have places to screw in pretty stable things. But the Adafruit color sensor is just this panel, you need to solder it, it's hard to find places to mount. So uh, it's uh, one upside of the Adafruit RGB sensor is that it's relatively cheap compared to the other ones, but we found that soldering it, finding a place to mount it, trying to protect it, is not worth it compared to the modern robotics color sensor and the ref color range sensor. Next we have the distance sensors. These are sensors that detect the distance from the center to whatever's in front of it. 
uh, usually in centimeters or inches. Uh, first we have the red color range sensor. This is the same sensor as before on the other color sensor slide. Um, this one, it, it's a fairly reliable sensor. It has a range from 5 to 25 centimeters. So it's not the most versatile where uh, it won't be good for detecting long distances, maybe to walls, but it can be good for up close, uh, small, precise things. It also costs $14, which is fairly cheap for a sensor. Next is the modern robotic range sensor. Uh, this is a sensor you'll see a lot. It's very common among FTC teams because it has a lot of uh, versatility. Uh, it has a range from 1 to 255 centimeters, so it can be used in pretty much any situation. You're never going to need to detect more or less than that. Um, it has two different kinds of sensors on it, uh, using an optical detection from 1 to 5 centimeters and the ultrasound for all others. Uh, and it will cost about $45, so it is pricey. Uh, generally, in our use of the sensor, we found that it has some reliability issues, where sometimes these, uh, the values will not be correct, or they'll change over time. So one time you might detect it's 40 centimeters, and the next time it's 41. Uh, but this can be worked around just by uh, playing with the sensor and updating values over time it will end up being uh, reliable enough for a competition. Next is the Max Spotic Sonar Rangefinder. Um, this has a very long range, uh, 6.45 meters, and so it can be used in, pretty, in any situation. Uh, it's also very good at, at detecting small objects. This can be a good thing or a bad thing. You can use it for finding small, minute objects but it can also, it also might detect the wrong object depending on the robot's position. Uh, where it could detect something, a ball in front of the wall instead of the wall you're trying to look at. Uh, it also has multiple models, so you can get different kinds of the sensor that all have varying fields of view. Uh, some have wider uh, fields of view for detecting large objects or just detecting all sorts of objects to very fine focused ones or uh, smaller objects. It's also fairly cheap at $25, uh, which is it's, it's fairly cheap. Finally, there is the REV 2M or 2, 2 meter distance sensor. Uh, this has not actually been released yet, but it is one that's going to be coming out. It uses, it can detect from five to 200 centimeters, so again, a very versatile sensor, and has a one millimeter resolution. That means that it can detect to, to uh, instead of detecting 200 centi or 150 centimeters, it'll detect 150.12 centimeters. So it's very, very reliable, uh, at least from what we've seen. Because This is because it uses lasers, and uh, this is the first F sensor that is actually legal in FTC that uses these, these lasers. <laughs> I, we haven't really worked with the sensor, so there's not much that we can say on it, other than that it's expected to be very versatile and reliable. Next we have heading slash IMD sensors. These are sensors that detect the robot's position, speed, uh, rotational velocity, and so it's used for like the diagnostics. Um, so all, all, most IMD sensors, pretty much all that you're going to see, are, include a few different things. First is an accelerometer, gyro, a rotational velocimeter, and a z-axis heading detector. So it can detect uh, acceleration in x, y, and z-axis. It can detect uh, motion and speed in, the, in each axis. And then it'll have a, dire a direction showing the heading and the z-axis, which is the plane that you're going to be moving around most in. First is the Navix navigational sensor. This is uh, a very accurate uh, measurement have very accurate measurements, so if you need precise measurements, then this is going to be your sensor. Uh, although it is also most expensive at $100. Uh, a few other things to note about it is one that when using it, it your robot will have a much longer initialization process. So, and that can sometimes be an issue. Uh, and also that it, the, for the software, it requires an external driver. It's not included in the default FTC library package. 
uh, which means that if you are using OnBot for your software, then this will not be an option. Uh, second is the Adafruit BNO055. Uh, this is a fairly accurate measurement, uh, measuring device. Uh, is that, and it's also built into the Rev Expansion Hub. So if you have a Rev Hub, then you, this is a fairly standard one to use. Uh, and it costs $35, but if you're using it with the Rev Hub, that Rev Hub is already going to cost $150, but it's free included in it. And finally is the Modern Robotics Integrating Gyro. Uh, this is very poor accuracy. It's not going to be a very reliable sensor, especially for the price, since these two have different accuracy and only a slight price, price difference. And also it does not have an accelerometer. So it only has the gyro, the rotational velocimeter, and the z-axis heading detector. The way we compare the, ac the accuracy of these three sensors is by having them execute a 90 degree turn and then seeing how far off the robot was from an actual 90 degree angle. Um, so when using the Navex, we, we found that it would be within one degree of 90 degrees on that turn, uh, which is very accurate. When using the Adafruit, it was within two to three degrees. And with the Gyro, it was within six to 10 degrees. This is a robot that we built for demonstration purposes. It will be driving back, uh, back and forth without correction and then with correction. So this is the robot driving without correction. You can see that as it moves, it does tend to curve to the left slightly. Uh, with larger and heavier robots, this effect is also much worse. Uh, the way that the IMU correction works is that it, it, it detects the original heading of the robot and uh, it detects the original heading of the robot before it starts moving and then as the robot moves it detects any change in that and then adjusts one side of the robot's motors to be either slightly uh, less or slightly more uh, in order to correct that uh, heading change. Um, so when the heading is, when the correction is on, this is what the robot looks like. You can see that it's much uh, more straight and it's, de it's definitely a much cleaner movement. Uh, the, the, we have a motor ratio that the robot uses. So at the, at the moment, whichever side, or one of the sides of, of the mo robot is multiplied by 0.9. So it moves 10% slower. This is used to correct the heading. Uh, if the rate, the power ratio is too low, I mean it's correcting it too much, then it'll start to do the kind of wiggle like this. So there's a bit of fine tuning to be done there to get the right value. Now we're going to be going over how to utilize the robot controller camera uh, during a match. Uh, you, with this method, you can then utilize both the front-facing and the rear uh, and the rear-facing cameras on your phone. Uh, for purposes, uh, for our purposes, there's many ways to do this. You can code it all by hand, which I highly recommend not doing. But uh, the way that we did this is that we used Vuforia, which is a free e library that you can access on their official website, Vuforia.com. Um, and this allows you to track any 3D object or 2D image. Uh, this speeds up the process from developing to testing, so oh, uh, you don't have to mess around with your code for nearly as long as you would if you end up coding anything by hand. And also, oh, it, the Vuforia, uh, Vuforia library interfaces extremely well with the already included Android color and bitmap classes, which will allow you to manipulate both bitmap, uh, bitmap, bitmap variables those, and uh, test the colors for those if you were going to be using it for as, as a secondary color sensor. Um, so for the phone camera, when it comes to selecting a phone to be using this, we'd recommend using something with a larger sensor on whatever uh, side you're using, if you're using your front facing, thing, uh, that's would recommend not doing that because a lot you can get a lot better images from using your rear facing camera. But when it comes to selecting the phone, you want to use something that has a larger rear facing camera sensor so that it can take in more light. And also, if you have a uh, camera with a higher resolution, you can recognize it, recognize objects and images from farther away. Um, so, in order to access the Vuforia SDK, hey, it's all on their uh, website. Hi, right, and the first link right here is developer.vuforia.com slash download slash SDK. All these links will be available down in the description. 
And uh, in, in order to access the SDK, you will also have to log in and create a license, which we'll go over on the next slide. But uh, instructions for installing the SDK can be found also on their, their website under their library section. So library.authority.com, blah, 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 blah. Uh, it's all getting started with Android development. So uh, now we're going to be talking about creating and managing for a targets. Uh, license keys will also be available well, in this part, when you try and navigate to it, it'll re redirect you to the uh, creating a license key if you already have an account available. Well, all of this is free, by the way. You, there is an optional pay plan that's mainly meant for businesses who want to be using the software during de uh, development of products. Um, so, on, uh, when it comes to uh, managing your Vaforia targets, you want to go to their target manager, which is available on their website. Right, you'll be able to add what are called databases, which are a uh, their own proprietary version of a file that allow that tells the Vuforia library what to do with the information that you're that's given, and it'll be able to recognize the, your image or your 3D object from there. There's multiple ways you can do this. You can go into their website and use it, or you can create a th custom 3D um, 3D model. Well, that you can now feed into the Vuforia, uh, Vuforia target model target generator, or you can also use the Vuforia object scanner app, which is available also on the same uh, under their downloads uh, slash tools section. And uh, the Vuforia object scanner is all on, a, uh, on the, an Android phone that you can use with the APK that's provided on the page. Uh, the model target generator is really meant for um, using a th uh, to use to convert a 3D model into a database, which you can then use to track on the Vuforia library. Okay, but uh, you can do what you want with that. And so that's pretty. That's pretty much it. Uh, other all, all the rest of how to use the Vuforia library is all available on their website under Getting Started with Vuforia, which was available on the last page. Also, all these links will still be in the description below. Here are a few miscellaneous sensors that we've used. I don't really fit into the other categories, but are still important to mention. First, we have the touch or the limit switch. Uh, this is a very simple physical digital sensor where it just has a switch on it where when it's pressed, it just it returns. Um, this can be used for a lot of things such as limiting motion or detecting collision. We can put a long piece of plastic or paper on the end of it to increase the size of that switch. Uh, uh, for example, we used it on a track that was loading balls to throw so when the ball reached a certain point it would hit the switch and stop the motion of it. Uh, it can be used for a lot of things um, although it is not always going to be used and, that can, and the conditions for where it is usable are sometimes rare. Um, <laughs> next we have the sharp proximity sensor. This is uh, it's sort of like a limit switch with an extended range on it where it will detect if something is within either 10 or 15 centimeters depending on the model. So if something in front of it is within 9, is nine centimeters away, it will return. But if it's 20 centimeters away, it won't return. So it's true-false. Um, what's important to note about this sensor is that the beam or the narrow, it has a very narrow uh, beam of vision. So uh, the, the field of view of it is very focused. It's going to be used for very precise measurements. It also has a pretty short range, about 10 or 15, so it's used up close. And finally, we have the Modern Robotics Optical Distance Sensor. How this sensor works is it detects how uh, the whiteness of whatever it's looking at. So if it's a white piece of paper, it'll return a high value. If it's a, a black tar or black uh, mat, and return a low value. And each color also has its own, it falls into that spectrum. So it sort of sees things not, it sort of sees things on a grayscale. It also has a max range of eight centimeters. So uh, it's, it's also fully close range. Thanks for watching. Uh, if you have any questions, you can leave us a comment below or send us a, an email at this email or uh, a message on Facebook, on this Facebook. Wow.